Hi everyone, my name is Aisha Shah. I am the director for Special Political and Decolonization Committee, that's SPECPOL, at HMAN India 2016. Um, and I welcome you all to the first HMAN India webinar on HMAN Rules of Procedure. Um, this webinar is intended to give you an overview of the rules of procedure that will be followed at HMAN India so that you know what to expect in terms of committee procedure and you're more than welcome to ask queries regarding the same um, in the chat box. If you can't hear me at any point in time, please type it in the chat so I can troubleshoot it, hopefully fix any issue that might arise. Um, and just to know before we start off, the complete H1 India um, rules of procedure is in a document known as Guide to Preparation uh, that will be available on the H1 India website. So please be on the lookout for that and read it before you come to conference because that will contain in detail all the rules of procedure that we will be following at H1 India. Um, because this is a webinar, I won't be able to go over each and everything that's in rules of procedure, but I'll go over the main points and make um, an effort to give you guys at least the minimum level of acquaintance with rules of procedure that you should have before you step into committee. But please do go ahead uh, and refer to the entire document so that you're well prepared. Great. Awesome. So it seems like everyone or most people who've commented in the chat box can hear me. Um, so I'm going to break the webinar down in a few sections. Firstly, I'll go over the basics, uh, what rules of procedure are, what is expected in committee. Um, and then I'll sort of tie in the rules of procedure with how committee flow is expected to proceed during the four days of conference. Um, I'll be talking about the documents that delegates will be expected to present. Um, and then in the end, I will go over a few nitty gritties of other terminologies that are incorporated in committee. And then I'll leave sufficient amount of time um, to address any questions that you guys may have. Um, just to ensure smooth running, I wouldn't um, stop and answer questions as you type them. Um, but Please, when you have a question, type it in the chat box. And in the end, I'll just take all those questions and answer them. Great. Um, so let's start with the basics. What are rules of procedure? Um, in any given committee, there are several viewpoints. Um, and if you're in the General Assembly Committee, you, have, you may have up to 195 delegates, which means potentially 195 different stances, different ideas. Um, and at HMAN India, what we really value is delegate input. And over the course of the conference in your committee, um, debate will progress. Delegates will find themselves agreeing and disagreeing, negotiating with other delegates, working with several different viewpoints, and trying to come to a consensus um, on a resolution. So in order to ensure smooth running of committee uh, and maintenance of decorum, you have rules of procedure that have been set in a manner that allows everyone to be on the same page about how committee, delegates and dais included, will work together. Um, towards finding a resolution for the set topic area. So it's not meant to seem daunting, although it might seem so. It's just meant to ensure that there's smooth running of committee and everyone's uh, getting an opportunity in the best possible manner to present their views. So one thing that's very important for committee to start um, is for the committee to have quorum. Now, quorum is a percentage of registered delegates uh, or members of the committee that must be present inside the committee room um, for the committee to either start or if people have left in the middle of committee um, for debate to continue in committee. So at HMAN India, um, for productive purposes or for efficiency purposes, it's assumed that quorum um, is has been fulfilled when we start committee or continue committee, but at any point in time, um, delegates may raise a motion and ask the chair um, to just double check if quorum has been met. So quorum means, 20, at each one India, means that 25% of the members uh, of the committee must be present inside the committee room. So there might be times when it's the middle of conference and delegates are working outside the committee room to work on documents and there are too many delegates outside. That means productive debate cannot happen inside the committee because not enough people are present to have um, adequate amount of diversity in the views that are being presented. So um, in that case, the chair or the director may call delegates from outside the committee so, to, so as to ensure that we do have a minimum number of delegates um, to have good debate in committee. Other basics are that English is the official language and working language of the conference. That means 
when you're inside the committee room or outside discussing anything related to committee, when you're conversing with other delegates, when you're conversing with the day staff, you must use English language. Um, it's a very minor point, nothing to really have a debate on, but just please keep in mind that whenever you're working, you should be speaking in English. Um, another important point is that H1 India has a no electronics policy inside committee rooms. So that means you are not allowed to use laptops, tablets, mobiles, computers, um, any electronic devices inside the committee room, especially during formal debate. Um, sometimes directors will allow delegates to use, uh, commit, uh, to use electronic devices when they're in an unmoderated caucus. Um, or they may not allow them to use uh, laptops or any other electronic devices. So it really does depend on the director. Uh, but please make sure that you're not using electronics inside the committee room. If you absolutely do need to use it or think that it's absolutely essential, please write a note to your director and see what he or she says. Another very minor point, but important point, is that badges and placards are required uh, for you to be recognized by a moderator. So if you lose yours, please get a replacement for delegate services most likely your director will not recognize you if you don't have an official H1 India placard. Um, other things, um, something that's different at H1 from other South Asian conferences, model UN conferences, or even other international model UN conferences is the makeup of our dais. So a dais is um, what you would otherwise maybe call an executive board. Um, but at H1 India, it's called a dais staff, which includes your director, uh, who will also be serving as your moderator and then your assistant directors. So the director is the person who has written the background guide, who has set the topic area, who's the substantive expert um, on the topic that's being discussed in committee. And in his or her capacity as a moderator as well, that uh, your director will be overseeing the proceedings of committee. Uh, he or she will be the one who uh, will be moderating debate. Uh, and so your director will also be um, the expert on procedural matters. Um, so, in short, your director is the most powerful person in the room. Um, that comes from a place where the director is obviously very knowledgeable, has done this many times before, and is here to facilitate a debate and ensure that we're being productive inside committee. The director's decisions are final, um, but in some cases, if uh, you feel that a director is not perhaps following parliamentary procedure correctly, uh, you may raise a point of order, or if there's something that the director is doing and you might uh, want to know why uh, a certain thing is being done, you should feel free to raise a point of par uh, personal privilege um, or parliamentary inquiry, but um, just know that the director is there um, to, be, to have the final say in committee. Um, and then one thing to note is that even though this is a, a webinar on h -Man India rules of procedure, uh, sometimes, and these, sometimes these rules um, may be modified by directors to ensure more effective running of uh, their individual committee. So please know that these may be modified by your director. Um, and in case a director says something that's different than what's being said in this webinar or, or what's noted um, in the ROP in your uh, guide to delegate preparation, you should go with what your director has said. And assistant directors, um, are just a few other days members that will be there to a to assist your director and to also um, be present as a liaison between you and the director and will be there to help you out with other queries that you may have. So now we'll move on to the second part of um, our webinar in which I will try to explain how rules of procedure um, are incorporated at, a, at every stage in committee. So. Imagine that you are entering committee for the first time. It's the first committee session. Um, after the director and the days have introduced themselves, um, maybe the director will have certain notes or certain announcements that he or she wants to share with you. Um, after all, the initial introductions and setting of the pace of the committee um, have been done, uh, the director will take roll call. Roll call is, as, is self-explanatory. Um, the director may going through the list of registered members in the committee and noting down whether each one of them is present or not. Um, one thing to note over here is that you might say you're present. If no one says anything, you are considered absent. Um, you might also say you're present and voting. Now, one thing to note in that case is present and voting obligates you uh, to vote during every substantive matter in committee 
during that um, committee session. So if it's the last session and you're voting on the draft resolution and in while taking attendance you said that you're present and voting, you may not abstain from voting. Um, so that's something to keep in mind um, and something that you should not overlook when you're um, saying present. So therefore, a lot of directors usually just recommend saying present so that you have that flexibility in case you don't want to vote yes or no for any substantive query. Um, so that's all for roll call. If uh, One more additional thing. If, for example, um, you're late to committee or once you enter committee, your name has already been called out, i.e. you've already been listed as absent in committee, um, you may write or actually you should write to your director on a piece of note um, telling them that, it, you, that you're here um, so that they may mark you as present. Um, after roll call has elapsed or has been carried out, um, the director will take motions to open debate. After that motion has passed, um, typically you do have a motion to set the agenda. This is something that's standard across most model UN conferences. Um, Specifically for H1 India this year, since every committee only has one topic area, there is no need to set an agenda simply because the agenda has already been set. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is when, once you enter committee on the first day, there will be no setting of the agenda or any debate for and against setting the agenda because the agenda has already been set. Typically after, setting, uh, after everyone's been aware um, of what topic has been set, which in this case everyone is already aware of, Delegates um, start speaking on the general speakers list, which is in short also known as the GSL. Um, the general speakers list is a forum where delegates can share their comments, um, their concerns, things they think are important, um, sometimes in a particular order of how, the of how they think the committee must discuss them or address them. They may raise questions to other committee members. Um, and this was basically meant to be a general forum where you're not having concentrated debate on a focused topic, but you're generally raising points that you think are important for everyone in the committee to know. Um, the default speaking time for the general speaker's list speech is one minute, but delegates may raise a motion to amend the speaking time at the discretion of the director. Um, usually, the speakers on a uh, general speakers list are selected at the beginning of the first session where the director may ask all those wishing to speak to raise their placards um, and they and the director may start calling out names of uh, different delegates the assistant directors most likely will be taking them down uh, and usually they're being projected on a projector screen in the committee room so that everyone's aware of the order in which delegates are expected to come up and speak um, after a certain while, the director may stop calling out names or recognizing names, um, but in that, um, it doesn't mean that director will not be taking more people for the general speakers list. Usually, it just means that we're ready to hear people speak, um, and you should then send notes up to the day staff asking to be put on the speakers list. One thing to note is that once your name is on the speakers list and you haven't spoken, you're still waiting for your turn, you cannot send a note up to the day staff asking you to be re-added. So you can't have your name on the speakers list twice. Um, or like, you can't have your name active or waiting to be um, recognized um, on the speakers list. So once you're on the speakers list, you can only re-add your name after you've spoken and your name has been striked out. Um, it's a very minor point, but something that just makes things a little messy, especially when sometimes general speakers list in the General Assembly are 50 or 60 speakers long. Um, even after you have moved on to discussing things during moderated caucuses, uh, and I'll be telling you guys more about that, people can, or delegates can still add their names to the general speakers list. Just um, know that speakers list is meant to be a general forum, and therefore once we've progressed enough in committee that there are certain aspects on which uh, which um, delegates are required to focus debate on. Generally, the committee does not go back to the speakers list um, again. And therefore, if your name is not being called out in the speakers list, know that that's because we're debating on the moderated caucus and the speakers list is there but not being used. Um, so it's nothing to worry about. Uh, one thing to note um, for speakers list, is that they're different, that, that delegates are expected to fulfill the time 
that um, has been set. So you're expected to make a one minute speech uh, if you're sticking to the default time. In case your speech ends before that one minute, you may yield the rest of your time to, some, to someone else, to the chair, or to questions. Um, these yielding your time are called yields, and they are three yields that you can um, conduct or three yields that you can make use of. Um, yields to the chair means that whatever your remaining time is, the chair will absorb it, and debate will just move on uh, to perhaps the next delegate who has been recognized. Yields to another delegate would mean that Say um, you've only given a speech for 40 seconds, you have 20 seconds remaining, this delegate says, I yield my time to the delegate of Azerbaijan. Um, that means that the remaining 20 seconds will be given to the delegate of Azerbaijan so that he or she can come up um, and give a speech. Um, and the third kind of yield is yield to questions, which means uh, the delegate opens the, the floor to receiving questions from other delegates. Um, for people to ask questions, uh, they may raise their placards, and the chair will recognize delegates that may ask questions to um, the delegate who's speaking. These questions should be short and should pertain to the speech that the de delegate has just made. Um, and the delegate who uh, has been speaking can only take 30 seconds to answer each question. And Um, yeah. Only the delegate, uh, sorry, clarification, the, dele the delegates asking questions can only answer questions that are 30 seconds long. Um, so you can't have a question that's going on and on. Um, and the delegate will then, the delegate who's already speaking, uh, will then answer those questions in whatever time that um, is remaining in the one minute that he or she was initially given. Um, one thing to note is that they are, the yields are only permissible in the general speakers list speeches. So where once you're giving speeches in moderated caucuses, uh, you're not expected to yield times. So then we come on to the other form of formal debate that you can do in a model UN committee, and that's moderated caucuses. Moderated caucuses are sort of forms for focused debate on certain aspects of the topic. It's, uh, it allows debate to be streamlined. It allows delegates to prioritize what issues um, they want the committee to address. Um, and it requires a total speaking time, uh, a to an individual speaker's time, and a topic for discussion. So for example, if we're discussing a topic, um, a delegate may raise, uh, for example, if you're discussing the Millennium Development Goals or the Sustainable Development Goals, um, a delegate who's been recognized by the chair um, may raise their placards and say, this delegate wishes to raise um, a motion to discuss um, Sustainable Development Goals um, 1 uh, for a total time of 20 minutes, individual speaking time of 1 minute. Um, and then that's how you will raise uh, a motion. Um, after taking a few motions, the director will get the committee to vote on them in order of most to least disruptive. Um, and whichever motion gets passed um, will be the motion that the committee will discuss for the next whatever amount of time that's been set. Um, a note on combinations of total time and speaking time. Sometimes delegates uh, wish to be a little more creative with how they frame the timing or set the time parameters for their questions and want the individual speaking time to be 45 seconds. Um, that's very cute, but make sure that then the total time that you set with that um, adds up and all those 45 second speeches will add up. So if it's a 45 second speaking time, have um, the total time speaking time be nine minutes, not ten minutes. So because we want um, forty-five seconds to be absorbed by the speaker and not um, exceed or go under the total time limit that's been set. One more thing um, to keep note of is um, that if your speech ends shorter or ends before um, the individual speaking time, um, the time is just automatically absorbed by the chair. So if, for example, you have um, a moderated caucus with individual speaking time one minute, 
but someone's only or there are a couple of delegates who have made 30 second speeches it doesn't mean that we'll have um, additional speakers if it's a, a moderate caucus for 20 minutes total individual seeking time one minute you will only have 20 speakers uh, for that moderated caucus another thing to keep in mind is um, that you cannot have a moderated caucus uh, for more than 20 minutes on a specific topic so if you've raised a moderated caucus with total time 15 minutes um, and delegates feel that they need to extend this moderated caucus because um, there needs to be more discussion on this or a few delegates um, need to speak or there has to be uh, further deliberation, please know that you can only extend that for a further five minutes. Uh, after that, it's up to the discussion of the chair. You might narrow it down further on something that's been raised inside your discussions earlier, but please make sure that you're not asking for an extension to an extension. Um, because that's not permissible um, by our rules of procedure. Great. Um, so the third way in which delegates discuss ideas um, that, that are present in the rules of procedure are unmoderated caucuses. Unmoderated caucuses um, are basically a time for delegates to informally gather and discuss ideas. Um, usually, they start with discussing what's ever been discussed before, um, sort of consolidate the ideas um, that have been put forth in the formal debate, um, and see how delegates can negotiate, form blocks, um, work together, um, decide on what things they disagree on, what things they agree on, um, and how we're going to resolve differences or find a resolution. Uh, unmoderated caucuses are also the time most delegates use to write working papers and draft resolutions, which are the documents that um, almost every committee has or expects to write at some point. More on that will be coming up later. Um, usually, directors do allow uh, delegates to use electronics during unmoderated caucuses, um, but some directors for example, may not allow use of electronics inside the committee room, even if it's in our moderate caucus. So please be uh, mindful of um, whatever um, decorum or sort of whatever um, has been set by your director and follow that decorum um, because the director is basically the boss of your committee. Um, another thing to note, just like moderated caucuses, is that unmoderated caucuses at one stretch cannot be more than 20 minutes in ta uh, more than 20 minutes long sometimes if the director feels that unmoderate caucuses are very productive and will be more um, productive in progressing the committee further than unmo than moderated caucuses then a director may allow an unmoderated caucus or an extension to an unmod for more than 20 minutes but again that's at the discretion of the chair um, and that's not something you should be expecting at all times other things that you should be expecting um, in committee is documents that you're expecting to, uh, to write, present, slash introduce, um, and then if it's a draft resolution, vote on it. Um, and then at the end of every committee session, there's a simple motion to suspend um, debate. And at the end of the last committee session, you adjourn debate. Um, so now I'm going to come on to documents that you're expected um, to write in committee. Again, if you have questions, um, please feel free to write them in the chat box. Um, I will be answering them at the end. Um, this is meant to be helpful uh, for you, and obviously there are different questions that people have because there are many delegates who are first timers, many delegates who work with the different um, rules of procedure. Um, so if you have something that you don't understand, or if it's something's unclear, please be sure um, to write it in the chat. So documents that you are present, you are expected to write or work on during committees um, are working papers and draft resolutions. Um, before we move on to what are the essentials of each, I just want to clarify two terminologies that are used around uh, the model UN world, and that's sponsors and signatories. Sponsors are authors of any document or people who have written that document. Signatories, on the other hand, are delegates who wish to discuss um, a certain document. Um, 
at H1 India, we do not have sponsors for either working papers or draft resolutions. It means that the director wants the debate to be productive and wants the committee to think as one body. And therefore, it's, it beats the purpose of it if we're sort of going down and noting who's written what um, on the top of our documents. The director is aware of who's working on what document, um, and delegates should be assured that their working is being recognized. However, we do not have sponsors written or recognized at the top of the document. However, for draft resolutions, we do ask that delegates write signatories for each draft resolution. And signatories are just people who wish that document to be discussed in committee. Please note that being a signatory to a draft resolution does not mean that you agree with each and everything that's mentioned in the document. Um, it also doesn't mean that you can't write uh, that you can't be a signatory to more than one document. So if there are multiple draft resolutions that you think are good or have good points, um, and you agree with parts of the parts of them, uh, but not other parts of them, feel free to be a signatory on multiple draft resolutions because that's just an indicator of this is a good draft resolution. This percentage of the committee feels that this should it should be discussed. Um, so what are working papers? Working papers are um, the documents that you are that you will be expected to to write and to give to the dais um, in the first half of the conference, um, usually around the second day, um, but it might vary from committee to committee and director to director. Uh, working papers are just an informal paper that gathers or consolidates ideas that that have been discussed in committee. Um, they're preliminary ideas. They can note policies that people that delegates have presented, um, and are just a way to gather important ideas and policies or suggestions that have been presented in committee, so that debate um, can be streamlined and everyone can have uh, an idea of what other delegates are speaking. Because sometimes uh, delegates are aware of what's happening in, for example, their own blocks or blocks that they're working with, uh, but not in other blocks, especially in general assembly committees. Um, working papers, since they're informal, um, they can be typed up. Some directors prefer this, but some directors will also um, accept working papers that have been handwritten. Uh, these can be, these need not follow any particular format. You can have um, working papers that are just bullet points of ideas that you think are important. Um, you can have maps or other visuals that you want to incorporate um, in working papers. That's completely fine, unless your director says otherwise. Um, and once again, you don't have any sponsors or signatories um, for working papers. One thing to note is that directors may limit the number of working papers they will expect uh, they will accept in committee, depending on the size of the committee, the kinds of discussions that are going on, um, and the pace at which the committee is moving. Um, Another thing to note is that once you write a working paper and you submit it to the day staff, you can't refer to it as a working paper or you can't consider it as an official document of the committee unless and until it's been approved by the director. So once you submit your working paper, your director will approve it or in some cases ask you to make changes or not approve it. Um, and later on, if, you're, uh, if your working paper has been approved, you can refer to it as a working paper. Um, and the direct, and that can be a document that the committee can refer to. The second kind of document that um, delegates are expected to write is draft resolution. A draft resolution is the ultimate document that your committee is working towards, and it's supposed to be um, a comprehensive document that lays out issues that the committee has recognized, uh, problems that it's recognized, solutions that it has offered, or proposes. Um, or um, our ideas that it thinks are important for the international community to consider regarding the topic at hand. Again, directors usually limit the number of draft resolutions they will expect depending on committee size um, and the kind of discussions that have been going on. Um, sometimes directors may limit the number of pages a draft resolution can have, but again, that's subject to the kinds of committees you're in. Um, please note that draft resolutions have a specific format that they're supposed to follow, so it have preambulary and operative clauses. Um, and you can find details of how um, you can format your draft resolution in the guide to delegate preparation. 
Um, one, another, one important thing is that while draft resolutions do not have sponsors, they do have signatories. Um, and the list of signatories shall be alphabetized. So um, there's no scramble for oh, who put in the most effort, hence their name should go on top. Um, it's just a simple alphabetized list of how many uh, people wish that this draft resolution or a particular draft resolution should be discussed in committee. Um, for general assembly committees, uh, you are expected to have 25 signatories before a director will read your draft resolution or even consider it. Um, for ECOSOC and regional bodies, it's eight. Um, and for um, the Security Council, or Historical Security Council, I believe it's five signatories. Um, so once you submit your draft resolution to the director, he or she will read it, maybe ask you to make a few changes, um, or will accept it as is. Um, the, once the director has approved your draft resolution, um, only then can it be introduced to the committee. So please do not assume that if you've written a document, it seems nice to you, you've submitted to the chair, um, then automatically you can start talking about draft resolution 1.1 or 1.2. Um, you need to wait for the director's approval, and the director will give it to you clearly uh, before you can introduce your draft resolution. Please note um, that although usually we do not reject draft resolutions, there may be certain draft resolutions that directors uh, may wish to not accept the first time they've been given or submitted for that reasons may vary and the director will most likely discuss those with you. Um, sometimes um, the directors receive more draft resolutions than they have said that they will accept. Um, this typically happens in general assembly committees all the time. Um, and in most of those cases, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of similarities between different draft resolutions. And in order to be productive as a committee, sometimes directors may ask or encourage delegates to merge. Um, so these are just small points that you should keep in mind and be open to uh, when you're writing draft resolutions or when you're submitting them and waiting for their um, acceptance. Um, so after uh, draft resolutions have been approved, um, it's important that draft resolutions are introduced to the entire committee. Um, these can be done in multiple ways. Uh, one thing I like to do, and some other directors also um, do this, is that they suspend rules of procedure, which means that um, we're not going to follow any particular set way of um, presenting or introducing these draft resolutions in moderated caucuses. Um, but instead, what they like to do is perhaps recognize three or four signatories for a particular draft resolutions who will explain the salient points of a draft resolution to the committee, and then probably set aside a couple of minutes for a question and answer session uh, so that delegates who probably aren't aware with every um, minute detail of the draft resolution will have, uh, will have the opportunity to ask questions to people who've worked on it. Um, this can be done for all the draft resolutions that have been presented. Sometimes, most likely, this is a very time-consuming process. And suspending the rules just allows the process to be more smooth. So you have a draft resolution. People who've written it are explaining it. Um, they're answering a few important questions that other delegates have. You move on to the next dra uh, draft resolution. And then once all draft resolutions have been introduced, you can refer to them as draft resolution 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, uh, whichever may. Uh, whichever um, they may be. Um, and after that, once the suspension of rules and procedure has happened and you've introduced those draft resolutions, um, you move on to discussing those draft resolutions in moderated caucuses, and thereon you can refer to them as draft resolution 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 um, et cetera. Please note that sometimes, um, while the director is reading the draft resolution, um, there may be a time lag between when delegates have submitted them and when the director has approved them or gotten them printed. Um, and that time can still be used for productive debate on um, what differences exist um, in committee or what different viewpoints there are um, without referring to the specific draft resolutions that have been um, presented to the director. So it doesn't mean that wh when you're waiting, while we're waiting for the director to approve a draft resolution, the committee is out of session or is in an unmod. Um, you will still be holding formal debate through moderated caucuses, most likely. 
Um, so after uh, draft resolutions have been introduced, have been discussed in formal debate for a while, um, amendments to draft resolutions can be presented by other delegates. Amendments are a way of delegates presenting um, slight changes to operative clauses only um, in certain draft resolutions in order to make it more sort of acceptable to them. Um, generally, it's done towards the latter half of the conference, um, since that's when um, we've introduced the draft resolutions. Please note that there are no friendly or unfriendly amendments. So for example, if a draft resolution has been accepted, it's been introduced, if anything in that draft resolution has to be changed, even if it's by one of the signatories um, themselves, um, they need to go through the proper procedure um, that's been laid out in the, in, in the guide. Um, it cannot happen that, oh, since I was one of the people who um, wrote this draft resolution, especially since there are no recognized sponsors, um, let's just add this to the draft resolution without the committee voting on it. That's not something that's acceptable. Um, so for amendments to be accepted, um, the director uh, accepted by the director, uh, they should have a certain amount of uh, a certain number of signatories on them, um, and that the break of the, uh, and the breakdown of that is in um, the delegate um, preparation guidebook. Um, typically for GA committees, it's 12 signatories. For ECOSOC committees of more than 40 delegates, it's 15. For ECOSOC committees for 40 or fewer delegates, it's eight signatories. Um, and these are just guidelines that are written. Sometimes directors may change um, the number of signatories um, for accepting the, an amendment. Please know that this is just one thing or one point on the checklist that you have to um, fulfill before a director can approve it. It may still happen that you have the correct number of signatories and the director feels that that amendment is not substantively different or substantively as important um, for um, the purpose of committee to be accepted or debated or voted upon and your amendment may be rejected by a dire director and the committee may not vote on it. Um, but that's just something that's from a substantive point of view um, and that's not something that is a make or break. Um, so amendments are only introduced one time after the director has accepted them. Um, once the director has, typically once the director has a list of a couple of, of amendments, um, they will tell the committee that the director is ready to accept motions to introduce amendments. Um, amendments are introduced, voted upon um, in the order in, in which they are presented, much like the draft resolutions. Um, so you, the director will most likely read out the amendment um, once the motion to introduce the amendment has passed. Um, then the director will most likely take two speakers for and against that amendment. Um, if there are no speakers against an amendment, we will automatically uh, wo go on to a vote for a closure of debate, which needs two-thirds majority to pass. Um, if there are two, sp uh, two speakers against closure, um, they should, uh, if there are speakers against uh, closure of debate, the director will most likely take up to two speakers for uh, the motion to, uh, for against the motion to close debate. Um, once those speakers have spoken, the director will take a vote on closure of debate. Um, if it passes by a two-third majority, debate on that amendment closes, and then the director will take a substantive vote on whether or not the committee will include that amendment in the draft resolution to which um, it seeks to amend. And for that, uh, it only needs a simple majority to pass. Um, now, this can be a very tricky procedure, so I recommend everyone familiarizes themselves with it. Um, it's very simple once you understand. Um, first, there'll be a vote on introducing an amendment. Um, then there'll be two speakers for and against that amendment. Um, then there'll be a motion to close debate. There'll be a vote on that motion to close debate. It requires a two-thirds majority to pass. If it doesn't pass, then you'll continue uh, debating on that amendment. However, if the motion to close debate passes, um, you will then stop debating on that amendment, and you will vote whether or not that amendment should be included in your draft resolution. So once all the amendments have 
been or once amendments that the director wishes to go through have been dealt with um, the director will accept motions to a motion to enter into voting procedure on draft resolution um, this typically means that we have draft resolutions before us we've had any amendments that d the committee wants to make to any of those draft resolutions we voted on them and now we have the final documents in front of the committee including the amendments that we've just passed or not passed um, so it's time for the committee to finally decide the one document that will serve as its final proposal to the international community please note that only voting members of the committee may vote um, so if you're an observer state such as Palestine or Holy See while you may um, take part in committee and debate um, you may not vote on substantive matters um, which includes voting on the draft resolution so once someone raises a motion or, uh, or once a committee will enter into voting procedure the correct way to do that is to motion for a closure of debate um, motion to close debate means we won't be discussing the draft resolutions further or anything on the topic further we'll only be voting on the draft resolutions the uh, the chair will take two speakers against motion to close debate. If no one wishes to close debate, debate will automatically close. Um, it will um, take two-thirds majority, uh, sorry, motion to close of debate uh, declare, uh, requires a two-thirds majority to pass. If it passes, the director declares closure of debate. At this point, um, all the committee doors will be barred by the assistant directors. Um, all non-committee personnel and faculty members will be asked to leave um, and they may not enter or re-enter uh, the committee room un until the voting procedure has uh, elapsed. Um, even if you're a delegate and you're outside the committee, rooms at the, uh, committee room at the time the doors are barred, you m will not be allowed to enter. So please be sure um, that you're inside the committee room before uh, the committee enters procedure on uh, voting procedure on draft resolution to make sure your vote counts um, so once the doors have been barred um, we will vote on draft resolutions one thing to note is that draft resolutions are by default voted on in the order in which they were introduced uh, so the default order would be we vote on draft resolution 1.1 if that doesn't pass we vote on 1.2 if that isn't passed, we vote on 1.3, etc. At HM in India, each committee may only pass one draft resolution. So the first draft resolution that gets passed will be the draft resolution that gets voted, uh, that um, gets adopted by the committee. So if draft resolution 1.2 passes, there will be no voting on 1.3 or 1.4, um, regardless of how many other draft resolutions are yet to be voted on. So voting on draft resolutions is a very, very important point and the order in which they've been set is also important therefore before we actually start voting on individual draft resolutions delegates may raise a motion to reorder draft resolutions so a delegate may raise a motion to reorder draft resolutions to draft resolution 1.3 1.1 another delegate may raise a motion to reorder draft resolutions as 1.2 1.1 1.3 and this can go on and delegates may raise uh, motions to reorder for as many permutations as is possible given the number of draft resolutions that have been introduced in committee. Uh, directors will take every motion to reorder that's been presented just because this is such um, an essential part of deciding what the proposal of the committee will be. The director will then take votes on motions to reorder in the order in which they were received. Since all of them are equally disruptive, um, that's the that's the order in which the director will take votes. So if for, and just as draft resolution voting, the motion to reorder that gets passed first will be the motion that's adopted. Um, no other motion, even if they've not been voted on, will be considered once a motion to reorder has been um, passed by the committee. Um, so delegates are advised to be very um, careful when they're um, either raising these motions or voting on them um, because it will impact how uh, the committee votes on draft resolutions. Another thing that 
the or another motion that the director uh, will entertain before moving on um, to voting on individual draft resolutions is division of question. Division of question is not something um, the director will ask for particularly, but if director if delegates feel um, that there are parts of uh, a draft resolution that they find acceptable and other parts that they find unacceptable and they wouldn't want to wish on a draft uh, they wouldn't want wish to vote on a draft resolution as a whole document but want to vote on separate clauses or separate groups of clauses um, they may raise a motion to divide the question um, when you raise or when a delegate raises a motion to divide the question uh, the chair will take two speakers for and two speakers against the motion to divide the question um, after that um, there will be a procedural vote on dividing the question, which will require a simple majority to pass. Um, since it's a procedural vote, no one may abstain. So everyone uh, must be on board and must vote on how to uh, on whether or not the committee must uh, or whether or not the committee should consider dividing the question. If a motion to divide the question passes, then the uh, then the moderator or the director will ask or uh, the committee for motions to divide the questions. Um, and they will take uh, all motions that have been presented. Remember that preambulatory clauses cannot be divided. Um, and you may only uh, divide the question on operative clauses. Another thing to note is that you cannot divide the question saying that each and every clause will be voted on separately in a draft resolution. It needs to be set or a group of, a group of um, clauses that need to be voted on individually. Um, and after the chair takes motions on how to divide the question, um, they will decide on what the order is of voting on these motions to divide the question. And they will be voted on in the order of most to least disruptive, which requires a simple majority to pass. Um, once a division has been passed, so for example, um, the division um, that's been passed says we'll vote on draft resolution 1.1. 1. 1. Um, we'll first vote on clauses 1 to 8, then we'll vote on clauses 9 to 12, and then we vote on clauses 13 to 15. Um, that division uh, will be voted on by the committee. So individually, you'll go and, you, uh, and the director will ask for votes on each group that's been um, raised and then which whatever set of clauses passes um, they'll be entered in the draft resolution and if a clause or a group of clauses does not pass they won't be um, added to the draft resolution if no division passes the draft resolution will remain intact um, After the vision of the question has taken place, you'll go on to voting on the final document as a whole, including uh, whatever has been either accepted or passed into it, and excluding everything that has been passed. Um, the final document will be put to a substantive vote, and it will require a simple majority to pass. I know that's a lot to take in, um, and you can definitely refer to um, the guide for delegate preparation, but it's just nice to go over these. Um, in the webinar so that you know that this is one form of voting that can take place. Another form of voting can be a roll call vote where a delegate may motion to vote by roll call. It's a procedural vote. Um, all delegates must vote whether or not they want a roll call vote to take place. If one third of the members of committee vote to have a roll call vote, that's what the committee will be doing. Um, there may be instances where the, di the di director rules this motion dilatory. Uh, which means that even though technically by the rule book de delegates may raise a motion for a roll call vote, the director feels that that's not something that's appropriate for the committee at that point in time, and they will not be voting on this motion in that case. However, if the motion passes, the director will call countries in alphabetical order uh, with a selected member. Um, it may be the first committee on the list, or it may be somewhere in the middle. Um, that's up to the director. Um, though not as complicated as division of question, roll call vote also has slight, uh, slight intricacies. In the first sequence, delegates may vote yes, no, abstain, or pass. 
Um, a delegate may request the right to explain his or her, vo her vote only when the director is voting against the policy of his or her country. And in that case, the, director, uh, the delegate will say yes with rights um, or no with rights. A delegate may only explain um, an affirmative or negative vote, not an abstention from voting. So you can't abstain with rights. Um, if you, in the first sequence, if, some, if a delegate has passed their vote, uh, in the second sequence, the director will come back to them, and then they either have to vote yes or no. Um, those are the only two options available for them, and they cannot uh, vote yes with rights or no with rights. Um, all delegates who've ha who have requested the right to explain um, their vote uh, will be granted time to explain their votes. Um, and in the H1 in, uh, India Rules of Procedure, um, your explanation cannot exceed 30 seconds. Um, one thing to keep note of is voting with rights does not mean that you should explain your vote and why you think something's been voted on generically. Um, this is a very particular kind of vote that must be used only in instances where delegates are voting for a draft resolution that, or for example, voting for a draft resolution in the in affirmative, which can contain something that's against their country's foreign policy. So they must, they are allowed to take that 30 seconds to explain why they're voting on something that president states they would not have voted on um, previously. So that's just uh, one thing to keep note of. It's not something to explain uh, your vote just because you feel like it. Um, after the roll call vote has concluded, the moderator will announce the outcome of the vote. Um, like any other uh, substantive vote, it does require a simple majority to pass. Um, the third option for voting on draft resolutions is when there's no roll call vote or no division of questions, which is ideal for the director. Uh, very easy for the committee is when you just simply vote in the order in which the draft resolutions have uh, been motioned to order uh, to vote on. Um, it's a substantive yes, no, abstain, um, and it requires a simple majority to pass. Okay, um, so that's all for documents and voting. Um, other notes that I would like to sort of highlight for you uh, before we move on to um, the Q&A session is are, include terminologies that sometimes directors will use. So sometimes you might, especially um, delegates who've been to Model UN before, sometimes you might have heard director saying sometime, uh, that something is out of order. Sometimes directors say that something is dilatory. So whenever a director rules something out of order, it means that that particular motion or point um, is not in adherence with the rules of procedure. However, when the director says that something is dilatory, it means that even though the point or motion raised might be acceptable, if you look at the rules of procedure, that's not something that the director feels is appropriate or the director does not want to entertain that motion or point, and in that instance, um, he or she will rule that dilatory. Um, other things to keep in mind are points. Um, there are only three points that are acceptable in H1 India rules of procedure. There is a point of order, point of parliamentary inquiry, and point of um, personal privilege. Point of order is when the director has been, if a, de if a delegate feels that the director has either not followed the rules of procedure or has done something um, that's against the rules of procedure, at that point, um, you are more than welcome to raise your placard and say, point of order, um, the director will accept it. You can explain why you think something was done um, against rules of procedure, and if the director is wrong, he or she um, will accept it. Um, the other point that you can raise is point of parliamentary inquiry. That's when, if you don't under if you don't understand why rules of procedure are being followed in a certain way, um, for example, you don't understand uh, how why one motion was voted on uh, before a motion you raised, or if 
Um, you don't understand why working papers are not being introduced because they aren't usually introduced, they're just discussed. Um, or if you want to um, ask questions about anything that's related to parliamentary procedure, please raise a point of parliamentary inquiry. The moderator will ex accept it, ask you to um, ask whatever query you have, and will answer it. Um, please do not hesitate to answer uh, to ask points of parliamentary inquiry because that just keeps everyone on the same page. Um, everyone knows what's going on and why a procedure is being followed in a particular way. Um, so if you have something that's unclear, feel free um, to ask a point of parliamentary inquiry, and the director will be more than happy to answer it for you. The third kind of point is point of personal privilege, um, and that pertains to you um, expressing anything that has that pertains to your personal comfort um, to directors. So for example, if you feel the room is too hot, or if you feel that you can't hear a delegate when they're speaking, um, the mic's not working properly, or um, you want something to be projected on the projector screen, um, Things like this that pertain to your personal comfort in committee, you can raise a point of personal privilege and uh, present that to the director. And he or she will try to accommodate you as much as possible. Uh, please note that if you wish to um, excuse yourself from the committee room to, for example, go to the restroom um, or leave for a moment and then come back for something urgent that's come up, you are not required to take uh, to raise a point of personal privilege to exit the room momentarily and then come back. Um, just raising, raising those points will disrupt the flow of committee for no reason, so please avoid doing that. But if it's something um, that's more important uh, and something that's a more longer term, please do raise those points. Uh, another thing that I would like to clarify over here is that there are no points of information or points of inquiry um, at H1 India. So you may not raise points to clarify something that someone has said, or correct another delegate's speech, or present facts um, pertaining to whatever be is being discussed in committee to present factual, uh, to present factual information, or to um, show that you've done research, um, or sort of step up one more um, ladder in front of the rest of the committee. That's Against the spirit of Model UN, that's not something that uh, we condone at H1 India. So please make it a point not to raise any points of information. Um, another thing to note over here that's not a point, um, but as just as additional information, um, sometimes delegates would like to present their research in forms of pads or notebooks or ring binders um, to the day staff, especially the director. That's not something that's required. Please do not do that. Um, the director does not have time to read through all of your research. We um, are confident that everyone who's in committee has put in the time and effort to learn about the topic, to formulate their ideas, to come up with creative solutions. Um, and the best way to, for you to make use of that research is to share with the rest of the committee in formal and informal debate um, and work on other delegates to make sure that those ideas are refined and are um, then included in a final proposal um, that will be your draft resolution. The last thing that I'd like to point out is um, right of reply. Um, that's a special privilege um, that can be given in certain, in certain scenarios. Now, right of reply is when a delegate feels that their personal character or their national integrity um, of the, the country that they're representing um, has come under question or has been um, unfairly addressed in committee or has been, uh, or if a, direct, uh, if a delegate feels that they've been insulted or incorrectly represented or their sovereignty has been breached. Um, something of that level, um, a breach of that level constitutes uh, an offense that a, de a delegate may ask um, a right of reply for. So if you feel that you've been offended in that manner, a delegate may write a detailed note explaining why the delegate feels that they're offended, um, send that note up to the day staff, um, and then the director will either approve or disapprove that right of reply, and also set a time limit for a speech that you can make in case your right of reply is accepted. Please note that right of reply is something that we hope doesn't come up in committee often. And if it is, um, the director may set a particular time limit, maybe one minute, maybe two minutes, um, depending on um, what kind of right of reply um, that was. 
but it may also happen that a director may not accept a right of reply either way the right of replies are not a make or break situation um and delegates are encouraged to keep working harmoniously towards the common goal that the committee has um so that's all from the general overview um that i had in mind and these are things that you should know at a minimum before you step into committee again a reminder please do look at the guide for delegate preparation um so that you're aware of how committee is going to proceed and what rules of procedure will be followed at this point um i will start asking questions if you have questions please start writing them in the chat box um and i'll be accepting them and answering them as i see them again um if you have questions you can still keep writing them i will be on live um for as long as there are questions and um queries that i can answer or address um it's great to see that many of you have found this helpful there's one question about um the general speakers list um again the general speakers list is usually um only used in the first committee session if for example uh on if for example all motions for unmoderated caucuses and moderated caucuses uh, fail then the committee will move towards the general speakers list and the default speaking time momentarily uh, move to the general speakers list and the momentary uh, and the default speaking time for uh, the gsl will be 1 minute it may happen that uh, the director accepts motions to uh, to amend the speaking time so it may go anywhere up to 1 and 1/2 minutes or 2 minutes um or if you want to reduce the speaking time though that's usually uh, discouraged or not or not uh, accepted um that can also take place um but yes that's a good question the time for gsl can definitely be amended regarding our electronic policies uh yes it is true that uh, no electronic gadgets will be allowed in committee rooms especially when the committee is in formal debate however there may be times during unmoz or informal debate when your director may allow you to use electronic devices again that's at the discretion of the director um this is done mainly so that director uh, so that delegates can share ideas and move the committee forward in terms of debate uh without being distracted by other electronic devices um or using electronic devices that m- that may not be accessible to everyone um but do uh keep in mind that there may be directors 
who will allow you to work on electronic devices during committee session, especially if you're in an unmoderated caucus or if you um, agree to go outside committee and do whatever you want on those electronic devi devices. Do whatever you want related to committee on those devices. Um, Especially electronic devices are used to write documents such as working papers and draft resolutions. Uh, most directors will accept only typed draft resolutions since um, they're longer documents, they're documents that are more formal that have to have follow a particular format. Um, so usually it's just more convenient for the entire committee um, for those to be typed out. But, but again, if you find that hard or inconvenient, please talk to your director and they may make alternate arrangements for you. There's a question about ROP, um, whether or not it's the same from last year. Um, it is definitely the ROP that was followed last year to a large extent. Um, I don't anticipate any changes have been made, but I do recommend everyone to still read them if um, they're aware of them already. Um, it just helps everyone if they're acquainted with them and it's fresh in their minds. There are lots of questions about whether or not this uh, webinar will be uploaded. Yes, um, the h -Man India team will be uploading this on their YouTube channel online. So you can definitely refer back to this um, later on. Also, there will be um, a second webinar in h -Man India Rules of Procedure uh, by the director of IOC, uh, Casey, Casey Gallagher-Smith, on uh, Monday, October, uh, August 1st, um, 9.30 PM Indian Standard Time. So if you've missed this one, um, or if you want just another perspective on rules of procedure or, an, uh, or want to um, interact with another director who's conducting a similar um, webinar, please feel free to join us for that. So there's another question. After the speaker's list, should our moderated caucuses focus on the issue itself or focus more on the country's perspective on it? Um, since moderated caucuses will also have delegates, apart from the delegate who's raised that motion, um, speaking on the caucus, it should focus more on something that's related to the topic as a whole. Um, typically, rather than focusing on a particular country, uh, or their stance on it. However, subject to how discussions are going on in committee session, um, they may pertain to certain countries' policies um, on a particular aspect of the topic. However, um, even if you're moving debate on a moderated caucus, you should try to keep it um, to focused aspects of the topic area that can be discussed by the entire committee um, so that the debate can move forward.
There's a question about position papers. And position papers, our guess definitely documents that are written by delegates. Um, but these are documents that um, will uh, be submitted by delegates individually on each topic area um, before committee starts or before even conference starts. And the deadline for submitting your position papers um, is um, July 25th. Um, and you need to up and all delegates need to upload them to one base. Um, information about position papers are also in your background guides. Um, so if you want more um, details on how to write them or what to expect, you can I, you can read uh, the information in your background guides. But also feel free to write to your directors in case you have any substantive queries uh, about the position papers. So there's another question about pointing out factual errors. Um, the reason why we don't have any point of inquiry or point of information um, at HMAN India is because directors are aware of any factual errors that are made in committee. Um, and the point of having a discussion formally or informally um, is so that the committee can move forward um, if there, uh, uh, and they can discuss ideas um, on how to resolve the question at hand. Now, Spending too much time pointing out other people's mistakes um, or pointing out factual errors is not as productive um, to the mission of the committee as would be discussing uh, more pertinent ideas and, uh, and um, streamlining the debate in a more productive manner. Um, so that's why we don't have any factual errors. Uh, if you want to point out a factual error, you cannot do so uh, using a point of order. You cannot do so using any other point. In short, please do not point out factual errors, since that just takes away time from constructive debate. Um, so there's a lot of people who are wondering whether they are not their chits in committee. Um, just for clarification, chits are the tiny notes that you pass in committee um, in the South Asian circuit. It's um, a very colloquial word. And since um, H1 is an international conference, we do not say that we use chits. Um, instead, you will be allowed to use notes in committee, which means that you will still be allowed to use small pieces of paper, uh, write any message that you want to send to the dais or other delegates pertaining to committee on those notes, and then pass those around uh, to whoever you want to address it to. Um, but please do not refer to them as chits, because that will just be confusing. Um, but definitely, you can write notes. There's a slight confusion also about uh, ring binders and bringing research into committee. Please note that you are more than welcome to bring in everything that you've researched in, about on in committee, but just don't present those uh, pages and pages of research to the director, because um, that's not what the director is there to read. Um, and your performance will be evaluated on how you work with the rest of the committee and how you use the, the research that you've done to work with the committee and move towards a resolution. But you are more than welcome to bring in research and have notes with you. There's another great question about comments. Um, so comments are basically points where or not points in terms of the specific terminology and rules of procedure, but um, comments are opportunities for um, delegates to comment on a speaker's general speaker's speech if there is time left in um, the speech time of that speaker, which the speaker has not yielded to the chair, another delegate, or to questions. So in case a speaker has spoken for, say, 40 seconds, there are 20 seconds remaining, um, and the speaker just goes to their seat and does not yield, then, this, then the director will accept two 30-second comments. That means delegates can raise their placards, and the, speaker, uh, and the director will recognize two speakers to come to the front of the room and give um, a 30-second comment on the speaker who's just spoken. Um, and the speech of the speaker who's just spoken. Uh, again, this is an opportunity for you to comment on the speech itself and not anything the speaker 
is doing otherwise or any other thing that's been discussed in the committee a comment must pertain to the speech that has um, just ended You can definitely bring in electronics um, inside the committee room as long as you're not using them and they're not switched on. Um, you can bring them and keep them besides you when you're in committee room, uh, but you're just not allowed to use them.